Good morning. In the Gospel of John, Jesus said, you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. What I want to start off today is talking about the truth. As uh, Carol mentioned, I'm going to be teaching a class starting um, two weeks from today, 9.30 in the mornings here at the church, and the subject is what every Christian should know. And it's based on a book that the bookstore will have, I think, hopefully next week, called Remedial Christianity, What Every Believer Should Know About the Faith, but probably doesn't. This is a particularly good book, and I have to tell you, um, this is something that I personally am very passionate about. Because so many of us are operating on ideas and beliefs that somebody else gave us. And this is not really to criticize anybody, but we tend to not really examine what underlies our belief system. This class will do that. It can be uncomfortable. And what the author of the book, Paul Allen Laughlin, tells you, and what I will tell you is this, that you can go deeper, you can explore, You can learn more, and where you can wind up on the other end may not look a whole lot like where you are today, but it might be a deeper and better faith than the one you have now. For me, the reason that I find this, you know, something that's a passion is because this search for meaning and truth within Christianity is something that has been a lifelong search for me. I was raised in a family where my mom at least told me that the Bible was this rule book and it told you everything you needed to do, everything you needed to know, all the way down to what kind of clothes you ought to wear and how long your hair ought to be. In my house, I couldn't go to movies. I couldn't dance. We didn't have church in the. Uh, we didn't have music in the church, at least not pianos and things like that. So, for me, it became an important part of my journey to find out what was really there and what did the Bible really say, and did it really tell me I couldn't do all those things? What really is this book called the Bible? 2 Timothy 3, chapter, uh, chapter 3, verse 16, you may know this passage. It says, um, let's see if I can remember it. Um, All scripture is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, and instruction in righteousness. I may be getting it a little bit wrong, but it's inspired of God. And many Christians will use that Bible passage to tell you that this book is the Word of God. And it's inerrant. I have to say, and I apologize if it offends anybody, but for me, to call this book the Word of God, and I used to do that, fairly recently actually, but I finally decided that is so deceptive that I refuse to do it anymore. This book is really not a book. There are 66 books in here. And they were written beginning probably about a thousand years before Jesus. All the way up until about 200 years afterward. And they were put together over a period of time. 
There were more than 66 authors, even though there are 66 books. And the reason that's true is because they got changed and put together over time. We'll talk a little bit more about that in the class. We'll talk about it a little bit more this morning. But the fact of the matter is that what you have here is a collection of books written by many people over literally centuries. That idea from 2 Timothy 3.16 that says this is the, you know, the scripture is inspired. Let me tell you a couple of things about that. First of all, at the time that passage was written, this book didn't exist. When he was talking about scripture, he was probably talking about, and nobody knows for sure, the author was probably talking about the Old Testament. Maybe some of the writings of Paul. But not this book, and certainly not this book in the format you have it today. Something else you might want to know. Second Timothy says it's written by Paul. It's pretty much accepted scholarship today that Paul did not write that book. Some people, some religion experts would even, one particular one named Bart Ehrman, who teaches at the University of North Carolina, has a book about documents in the Bible that he calls forged. This is one of them. The second, second Timothy is one of them. There's a name that uh, Bible scholars use for that kind of writing. It's called pseudonymous, written in the name of somebody other than the actual author. And think about it for a minute. Why would you want to do that? Why would you want to write something in the name of somebody else? If you were a conservative politician and you wanted to write something in the name of Ronald Reagan, why would you do that? Or a liberal politician and you wanted to write something in the name of John F. Kennedy, why would you do that? Credibility. Authority. You want to get somebody else to believe what you're telling them is the truth using somebody else's name. But if you just think about it for a minute, if I sit down and I write down everything I'm telling you is the truth, and a hundred years from now you pick it up and read it, is the fact that I told you it was the truth convincing to you? It's the ultimate in circular reasoning, really, to point at something in the Bible, like that chapter and verse, and say, this is what proves this is the word of God. And what Paul Allen Laughlin, the author of this book, Remedial Christianity, will tell you is that the Bible can actually withstand this kind of scrutiny. In fact, if you don't put it under this kind of a microscope, you really don't know what you're reading. Whenever I look at the Bible now and whenever I talk about stories in the Bible, I want to know the answers to all the typical questions you would ask of anybody else or anything else when you picked it up and read it. Who wrote it? When were they writing? Who were they writing to? What was the circumstance under which they were writing? What was the message they were trying to convey? And only after you get through all of that do you get to ask the question, what does it mean to me? What does it mean for me? 
Let me give you a couple of examples. If you never read the Bible through from cover to cover, most of us at least get through the first few chapters. How many of you know that there are two creation stories in the Bible? Yeah. Three if you count John. But there are two in Genesis. There's the first chapter in the beginning. And then there's chapters two and three that talk about how Adam and Eve were created. If you start reading and you're really paying close attention, you'll recognize that those stories are not the same. In fact, the order in which God creates things in chapter 1 is different than the order in which he creates things in chapters 2 and 3. And there's a reason for that. It's because... The stories were written at different times by different people and for different reasons. In fact, the story in chapter 1 was written probably about 400 years, 400 years after the story in chapters 2 and 3. First in sequence, after in time. The story about Adam and Eve was written in about 950 BCE. At least that's what Bible scholars today, it's pretty much uniformly recognized. It is a theory. Nobody knows for sure because it happened 3,000 years ago, right? But that's scholars' best guess. About 950 BCE is when the story of Adam and Eve was written. The story in chapter 1, God moving on the face of the deep, that one was written about 500 BCE. By a group of writers, a group of writers that scholars call the priestly writer. And the priestly writer, the reason they think the priestly writer was writing sometime later is that he was actually writing after the Jews had been taken into exile. There are things that you can point to in history and look at to tell, you know, given what they're saying, when was it they were writing? The story in chapter 1 is very similar to a Mesopotamian creation story called the Epic of Gilgamesh. It's also got some some things that are correlating to the story of Noah and the ark and the that whole story of, about the animals on the on the ship on the ark. Um, those stories were written after the end of the period of King David and King Saul. You know, they come later in the story, in the Bible. But, but these stories, this chapter 1 creation story, was written after the Jews returned, either during or after the Jews returned from exile in Babylon, which happened in around the 7th century BCE. All of these things are things that we you know, in 2013, can be pretty confident about. We don't have to continue to operate under a paradigm where we just accept things without question. And the more we know, the better off we are. The truth will set you free. One thing that a lot of people don't know It has to do with this issue of being taken off into Babylon again when the Jews were taken off into exile. But this idea that the serpent in the story of Adam and Eve was Satan is not the case. Again, that story was written about 950 BCE. 
this idea of Satan comes from the area over in sort of what is present day Iran, Iraq. Up until that time, the Jews believed God was responsible for everything. Obey God, you're blessed. Disobey, you're cursed. There was no Satan. Satan shows up in the Bible in the book of Job. And that's about 300 years later. The serpent was actually a wily serpent, a symbol in the ancient Middle East of something that was both wisdom and also sort of fertility. But it wasn't Satan. At the time the story was written, the Jews didn't have any concept of a devil. God was responsible for everything. Now let's fast forward and talk about Jesus for a little bit. How many of you know Christ was not Jesus' last name? (laughs) Christ is a title. It means the Messiah. When you come to our class, we'll talk about the difference between Jesus and Christ. And it's something that even is recognized outside of unity and in mainstream scholarship. They they talk about the Jesus of history and the Christ of faith. We'll talk about that. And I think, you know, most of us in this room probably recognize, but the other thing that a lot of people don't really ever think about, but I think it's worth recognizing, Jesus was never a Christian. Jesus was Jewish. When you comes to the Bible again and you start reading the stories about Jesus' birth in the, in the Gospels, the earliest Gospel, the Gospel of Mark, has no story about Jesus' birth. And if you read the stories of Jesus' birth in Matthew and the story in Luke and you compare them, what you discover is they're not the same. We have these Christmas pageants where all these stories get smushed together. And so, you know, there's wise men in one and not in the other. And that's true about almost every detail you hear and you read about in terms of the stories of Jesus' birth in Matthew and Luke. The stories, let me just give you a real quick rundown, and I I hope this won't get too academic for you. But Matthew, Mark, and Luke are what we call the synoptic gospels. And the reason they call them synoptic is because they're pretty much parallel. What modern scholars believe today is that Matthew and Luke were using Mark when they wrote their stories. Mark was first in time. Matthew and Luke were looking at Mark, using it when they wrote their stories. There's also a a non-existent gospel, at least non-existent today, but held to be, in theory, existent, a gospel they call Q, scholars call it Q, which is a German, stands for a German word, quelle, which means source. And the gospel Q is a gospel that was used by Matthew and Luke. And the reason scholars believe that is because there are overlaps between Matthew and Luke that don't overlap with Mark. And then separate and apart from those, Matthew and Luke had their own independent sources. Again, if you come to our class starting in two weeks, we'll talk about this in much more detail. 
and you'll understand why it is that scholars take this approach and believe that today. John is different altogether. That story, the saying that I used during the meditation, the story, the saying that I used at the beginning of this comes from the Gospel of John. All of those I am statements, I am the way, the truth, and the life, I am the bread of life, I am in the Father, the Father is in me, all of those are from John. If you really look at the synoptic gospels on the one hand and you look at John on the other hand, the picture you get of who Jesus was is completely different. Which one's right? People would tell you, uh, what I was told as a kid, is that these are just different people's perspectives. And there might be some truth in that. But what we know today is that all four of the gospels Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John originally circulated anonymously. They were only later attributed to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Nobody knows who wrote them. Nobody knows if there were any eyewitness accounts. Heaven and hell. We'll talk about that too. You know, Matthew talks a lot in in his gospel about the kingdom of heaven. Most scholars today would surmise, I think, that the reason Matthew talks about the kingdom of heaven, whereas Luke talks about the kingdom of God, is because Matthew's audience was Jewish. He was writing to a Jewish audience. And one of the things you don't do when you're a, a, a good Jew is you don't use the name of God. So instead of talking about the kingdom of God, Matthew talked about the kingdom of heaven. But there are other places in the Gospels that talk about this kingdom of heaven not being some place that you go when you die, not being something that happens after life. In the Gospel of Thomas, which is not in the Bible, he says, the kingdom of heaven is spread out upon the earth and people do not see it. And Luke says, the kingdom of heaven is within you. We'll talk in the class again about how it came to be that we sort of adopted these ideas about heaven in the afterlife and hell in the afterlife. But the word most attributed to Jesus in the Gospels, that is the one about hell, is actually a word called Gehenna. And Gehenna was actually a physical location that existed outside of Jerusalem during that time period. It's where basically all the refuse and trash was burned. That story about never ending fire, That was Gehenna. Never ending fire in a dump. And it just so happens it was also a place where they did child sacrifice. Charles Fillmore, and one of, and I've used this saying here before, one of my favorite sayings of Charles Fillmore, he says, I don't know what happens when you die, and neither do you. Jesus said, let the dead bury the dead. I came that you might have life, a more abundant life. That's what I came for. By the way, A lot of people these days, there's that whole series of books about, um, you know, the rapture and uh, the apocalypse. The book of Revelation, when you look at it the way that I was talking about looking at it in the beginning, who wrote it, when were they writing, who were they writing to, what was their message, what were the circumstances, 
It wasn't written by the same John as the Gospel of John. It was written much later, actually, than most of the rest of the books in the Bible, not all of them, but most of the books in the New Testament were written before the Revelation. Revelation was actually written, this is something that most people don't get until you really start getting into it. Some of the authors in the Bible were amazing authors. Y'all ever read Animal Farm? You know the book Animal Farm by George Orwell? And if you read it, it sounds like it's about a farm, right? With a bunch of animals and a pig's a king and blah, blah, blah. But we all know why he was writing that book. He was writing that book to describe the circumstances in Russia at the time. Revelation is like animal farm. The revelation is the Jewish version of animal farm about what it was like to live in the Roman Empire, probably under Nero. But it's not a predictor of what's going to happen in the future. It wasn't written for you and me. That doesn't mean we can't draw inspiration from it and that it's not worth reading, but it was a book that was written for Christians who lived under the abuse of the Roman Empire. So all those stories about heaven and hell and all of those, those are metaphors. They're not about something literal. I hope you'll come to the class. We'll talk about all of this. We'll talk about a whole lot more. The first chapter of the book is super thick, not in terms of how wide it is or how, how, how many pages it is, but just in terms of the information. So if you have an opportunity to read it beforehand, please do. And there's some great little exercises that'll help you realize and understand for yourself what it is that I've been telling you about this morning. There's one particular question. If you have time to read it and you're going to come to the class, or even if you're not going to come to the class, I'd still encourage you to read the book. There's a question. It's question E at the end of the first chapter. And what it does is it asks you to compare the stories of Jesus' death and resurrection in the four Gospels. Just read them. Write down, okay, here's what Matthew said. Here's what happened. Here's the order. Do that for all four of them. And then just look at what you got when you put them in columns. It's not the same story. And if you're bold and brave enough, don't stop there. Go all the way to the end of all four Gospels and look at what it has to say about the parent stories. Where did Jesus appear? Who did he appear to? What were the situations and circumstances that came about after the fact? And if you have a new revised standard version of the Bible, look at Mark and you'll see there are multiple endings in the Gospel of Mark. Some got added later. Some got added later to make pieces of Mark look more like some of the other Gospels, even though it was first in time. The original version of Mark has no appearance story. It has and ends with an empty tomb. That was the first story. There's another great book that I... This is when I first got onto this stuff uh, was when I was at a unity church in Houston and the ministers were doing a talk, a series of talks on a book called The Five Gospels. You may have heard of it. Written by a group of scholars, Bible slash Jesus scholars. It's new, relatively new. And they were going through the Bible in the Gospels and trying to figure out what did Jesus really say? As I mentioned before, Gospel of John really is a different 
Jesus than the gospel and the, uh, the Jesus of the synoptics. What you find out in the end is that today's Bible scholars, most of them would tell you that Jesus never said much of anything that's recorded as him having said it in John. That includes, you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. But this is an excellent book and an excellent resource if you want to understand what scholars today believe about the Gospels and about Jesus. I told you today I was going to tell you what every Christian should know. I didn't tell you I was going to tell you everything a Christian should know. So I hope you'll come to the class. I guarantee you'll learn something. And when you walk away, it's not always comfortable to know because we've operated with a belief system that's based upon things that aren't true. I believe that saying, even if it wasn't said by Jesus, is true. You will know the truth and the truth will make you free. Please come.